Hi, everybody. My name is June Kim, and I am an occupational therapist and a clinical specialist and rehab supervisor here at, at Kaiser and Park Shadelands in an outpatient clinic. Um, I have been a therapist since 1992, and I've been with Kaiser since 2008. Um, I am doing this on my volunteer on accord, and this is not Kaiser sanctioned, so I have to say that. Um, so this is actually more from my personal uh, perspective and experience and coming from the power training that I had. So with that disclaimer, I'm going to share my PowerPoint. And I hope you're all sitting in a very supportive chair that you can exercise and participate in. I think someone else has to mute themselves. Yeah, I'm going to uh, mute. Mute okay. all. Uh, give me a moment. Okay. So just a little more background on myself. Um, I am a Power Move certified therapist, and I do have advanced training in neurodevelopmental treatment and neuroinfra advanced upper extremity and fine motor rehab. And I've only been doing neuro rehab since 1992. That is all I know. So you're getting the wealth of information of my, my experience. And I encourage everyone to ask questions and interact as much as you would like. Uh, most of this information is from the, the Power Certification Workshop. We do a recertification about every three years, and this is where a lot of the resource is from. So I wanted to acknowledge them. So we get a lot of questions about occupational therapy. What do you do, and how are you different from physical therapy? Um, in occupational therapy, I like to describe it as your daily life skills, all the things you have to do from the moment you wake up to, to when you go to bed and everything in between. We want to help you be as independent and as safe as possible and help you come up with the best strategies or adaptations or techniques to make you as safe and independent as possible. So in occupational therapy, we address self-care, community and home management, all the things you have to go out into the grocery store, medication management, grocery shopping, adaptive equipment. We look at home safety and do home safety evaluations. We also do driving safety screenings. We don't take you out in the road, but we do all the preclinical assessments to see what type of crash risk you may be given some of the assessments. If you have to return to work, then we do address that. And we do a lot of motor retraining, vision rehab, cognitive rehab, talk about energy conservation and fatigue management. We also do splint fabrications and do health and living wellness promotion. And there's mental health OTs as well too that just specialize in behavioral health medicine. So in regards to Parkinson's, how can OTs help? It's mainly looking at your cognitive, visual, motor, self-care skills so that, let me get rid of these. Um, oh my goodness, sorry. That's what I was afraid of, things popping up. <laughs> um, we help you consult where you are in your stage, give you options as far as adaptive equipment or different adaptations or techniques um, that will help you do it a lot easier. So our treatment is to focus on your skills, your abilities, your safety, and your function. So in general, the neurotherapies, how we help with Parkinson's, and uh, I'm sure everyone's at a different level and different experience and different diagnosis as far as how long they've been diagnosed, but Parkinson's disease in general tend to make everything small. And it's the reduce, it's reduction of the dopamine that makes these smaller movements. And Parkinson's doesn't cause the muscle weakness. The muscles aren't being fully used because of the small movements. And so because they're not being used, they become weak. And so to maximize all your function, 
For Parkinson's, you can control your movements by doing it with intent. And we'll be going through this as far as what this means. But doing it with purpose and with intent and meaning. And why do we do that? We have two movement systems in our brain, the extrapyramidal and the pyramidal system. The extrapyramidal is the autonomic movements, or automatic movements, like blinking, swallowing, breathing unconsciously. This is something that just happens on a regular basis. That information of, of part of the brain without dopamine, it slows down. So the pyramidal system, they're responsible for the intentional movements. What it does, it gives you a signal, a stronger message that, hey, this movement has to be moved. And look, it wakes up the system. And that's what we want to do is that we want to reduce the dopamine that's happening and we want to expand it. So we have a whole team approach that we like to do with Parkinson's care. Obviously with your primary neurologist, the OT, the PT, the speech therapy, the family members, the caregivers, the support groups like this and community classes, we're all part of your care. And we're just a segment of how we like to maximize your skills. Okay, so let's get down to some of the components that we like to um, educate you with. These are all general. I understand everyone's at a different level and different needs, but this is just generally speaking of what's available. Okay. Do many of you have difficulty with buttons and fasteners? Do I, do I see a yes or no? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. Um, because the muscles and everything gets to get small, it gets difficult to do some of those fine motor skills. And dressing is one of the things that makes it challenging. And at the end of this PowerPoint presentation, I have links and resources where, of where you could purchase some of these equipments and adaptive, um, adaptive things. There's magnetics, there's zipper pulls, there's um, there's actually a brand clothing called Tommy Hill Figures that actually make a uh, fastenless clothing that makes it really easy to, to put on and off. There's button hooks available. I don't know if you guys have seen that, but it's just the larger grip. Can you see me? Can you Rick? Can you see me at all? Yeah, I can see you. It's a, a small image because you're okay. sharing the screen. The PowerPoint is the larger one. Okay. Um, later on, I can show it when I take off the PowerPoint right. then. Okay. There's sock gates available that help you put on your socks and reachers too, to help you reach so that you're not bending and um, putting yourself at high risk for falls. There's weighted utensils. There is lids with straws and cups. Um, Dysims, and I don't know, some of you have seen the liftware that really helps with tremors when you're feeding yourself. Um, it tends to off, it was designed by engineers um, of who were involved with people with tremors, and um, the liftware has an adaptive fork and a spoon that you can plug in and off to help you offset your tremors when you're eating. We also look at bathroom safety. Bathroom is the number one place where people tend to have falls. And it's the place we want to avoid because everything is hard all around you. And so one fall is one fall too many is the way we like to look at it. And so one of the safe and bathroom is the place that you most frequently go besides your, your kitchen, I would imagine, when you're going back and forth. So we want to make sure that that is one of the safe places that you can easily get on and off the toilet get in and out of the shower okay, and look at your bed mobility as far as how you're getting on and off and exploring different kinds of adaptive tools or poles or bed rails that are out there to help you do that easier. We also focus a lot on upper extremity and coordination and tremor management, and of course, exercise. So as we know, exercise is medicine. 
Did you know that about 70% of people who are diagnosed with Parkinson's experience hand tremors? And so how do we manage that? You can get it on one side. You can also get it on both sides. It can also um, be more up in the shoulder, head and neck area, or it can be down more in the fingers area. So with that, you definitely want to talk to your MD about whether or not you should be seeking some sort of medications, reducing the stress and anxiety, getting good night's sleep, planning for extra time to do some stretches before you engage in any sort of fine motor work, supporting your arm on a surface. I'll demonstrate that in a little bit as far as what that means. And giving yourself some hand breaks and doing both handed tasks instead of just one handed, if that one side of the tremor is a little worse than the other, is also helpful. And of course, doing some of these exercises that we're going to be running through in a little bit. Fine motor coordination. That's probably one of the biggest complaints that I get is that I have trouble writing or typing or doing something that are small and fine motor related. Fine motor meaning tip to tip. So what can we do? After we do our stretches, we can actually practice and therapeutically engage in some of these activities. Don't spend a whole lot of time on them. 15 or 20 minutes is plenty. These are small little muscles, not like the big muscles that you have in your thighs and your quads and your legs. So they fatigue a lot quicker. So doing just a little bits at a time tends to be very therapeutic. And when I say practice some of these activities, you want to do it with quality and control and to your abilities. And then progress as you feel like you're able to. But if you practice writing every day, that tends to be therapeutic. Typing, doing intentional typing instead of doing really fast typing with lots of mistake. If you slow it down and do sort of one key at a time, tends to be much more therapeutic. And lastly, when I say clap drum to a beat of the song, put on your favorite music and practice rhythming and tapping with your fingers and seeing if you can stay on tune with the beat of the music. That helps to work on the coordination and the timing and endurance because doing it for the first 10 seconds might be easy, but can you do it for the two minutes or three minutes of the song? That tends to be a lot harder, but you can practice those skills. Handwriting tips. So in handwriting, um, Many people say they start off nice and big and then it starts to go down. Do you experience that? Is that it tends to get smaller and smaller, all right? And so I'll demonstrate what it means to actually go through some of these purposeful, intentional handwriting. And that's to have both tables on the, on, supported on a table. And I'm gonna demonstrate that here for a second. You wanna have feet nice and flat and not have it be dangling. You also want a, to use a large size pen and not a small pen, the fattest pen possible. Mm -hmm. Like this, for example, you see the big grip? That makes a big difference than trying to hold on to something this small in your fingers, okay? You wanna work slowly and precisely and then pause after each break and doing that purposeful writing. And if you stretch your hands before you do your writing, that helps to offset some of that bending muscles that you tend to do. So keeping them nice and open helps. And some people, if they say they tend to freeze during the writing or some of the buttoning or fine motor activities, Sometimes staying with the rhythm and that beat tends to help you continuously engage in that activity. So I'm gonna pause here for a second on my PowerPoint and then have you see me. Okay, Brett, can you tell me if you can see me? Uh, yes. Okay, so now I, I can show you some of the, this is the button hook that I was referring to. Uh. So, yeah, what this does is that 
Here, I might as well demonstrate. Again, don't look at my Kaiser logo. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll go like this so you can see. So can you see me? Uh, yes. This is the way the button hook works, is that you thread this through and you put the button in. And then when you pull it, it comes right through, just like mm. that. And this, because it's a bigger grasp, rather than a small, this tends to be a pretty big button, but you know, those small little buttons tend to be pretty challenging. Let me take that off. Another adaptive tool are these built up utensils, like so, so that you can grip a little easier. The bigger gross grasp is a lot easier than doing a small little pinch on your fingers. And these are good grips that make it a lot easier for you to cut. And you've seen like the bottle openers where this tends to help grip a little easier. So when you're opening things, it gives you a lot more traction. The old fashioned way is to use the non skid liners. You can put that over a cup or jar and open it that way too. And it gives you a little bit of traction to open up. So when it comes to writing, when I talked about the pens, this is what I was showing before. If you use a typical pen, this is a too small of a pinch on your fingers, which is really demanding on all your small fine motor muscles. Here's a better one. It's already a little bigger. These are all just commercially available. Even fatter. This is called a big XXL and it gives you that nice fat grip without having to pinch so hard on those small muscles. Okay, so that's the first consideration is to find a big fat pen that works well for your fingers. Secondly, you're going to sit at a place where you're nice and well supported. If you're far away from where you're sitting and you're trying to write, this is a lot more demanding on my arm. So you wanna get nice and close to your surface as much as possible. And when we're talking about using two hands, let's say if my left has a lot of tremors, what you wanna do is you can still use the left but guide with the stronger hand to be able to help you feed yourself like so, okay? The other method that's recommended is to always have the elbows on the table. Gone are the rules that elbows on the tables are bad manners. What mm -hmm. it does is it gives you that support. So when you do any sort of writing, eating, any sort of fine motor work, even looking at your phone, whatnot, is that if you have your arm supported, that surface gives you the less shakiness. Okay. So with that in mind, I gotta move this thing here. When you're writing, my arm should be nice and supported. The table should be nice and close. I should have my feet nice and flat. Okay. All these different positioning and posturing makes a big difference on your writing. And then when I talked about writing with intent, is that I'm gonna do nice, slow strokes that are slow and intentional. And I like using lined paper and having each of the letters land on the line. And I'm gonna focus on each of the capitals being twice as big as my little little um, letters, lowercase letters, and then having the spacing be exactly the same, okay? It's not because you can't write, but we want to intentionally improve our writing. And this is one of the therapeutic measures of doing that. Can I pause and see if anybody has any questions at this point? Uh, yeah, of course. So 
If anyone has a question, you can either put it in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask. And by the way, there's also at the bottom of your screen a reactions button that allows you to do thumbs up or raise your hand if you have a question. So see if you can find that. If you can find the reactions button, do a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, at least one person can. <laughs> oh, <laughs> two people. Oh, more than that. Okay, we're getting somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but someone has a question. I see a hand up. Yeah, uh, so uh, Terry, do you have a question? Oh, Terry, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself. Do you see the microphone button, Terry? Oh, there there you, go. you go. Okay. You hear me now? Yes. Yeah. On the button, the button, I have that button holder or whatever you'd call the tool. Um, the small buttons work as well as the, the large buttons, or is there any? specific adjustments I should be making there? No, the small buttons, um, usually I say practice in front of a mirror, it's just so that you can see what you're doing a little easier because the mirror is gonna tell you if you're in the right placement or not. And the other strategy is to pull the other side as you're pulling the thread through. That gives you a little bit better traction and make sure that the little button is actually on the hook before you pull it through to the other side. But you can use that for any small or big and the the top button is the, on polo shirts have very small buttons they do and they're on a different angle and i have not been able to master that ah uh, um which makes sense because those are small and it's right below your neck so it's hard to see right so right. definitely do it in front of a mirror um, because the mirror is going to give you a little bit better angle as far as if you're doing it correctly. Okay. And then when you, when you thread it through, just kind of pause at each step and make sure you have it. Are you able to do it on an other button besides your pullover shirt? Yes. Bigger. Okay. Okay. Um, then you might want to take a look at the um, actual size of, of this, this top part. Right. And then make sure that when you hook it all the way through that it's it's actually on there. That if it's smaller than this size, then it will slip through. But you just have to make sure that it's bigger than that last little bit. Okay. Thank okay. You. Yeah. And then don't forget to pull on the other side as you're pulling it through too. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Great. Are there any other questions? Um, where do you get the paper that you write on the line paper, which That's, looks like uh, elementary school paper? I know you can get it at any uh, like Target or Staples or mm -hmm. um, anything like that. They and actually that includes come the fat pens. Yeah, you can find the fat pens over there. Luckily, those um, you could you can go and kind of practice. They have a little sample area just to see because some people like different glides of how how it likes to smoothly, they like gel or they like ballpoint, so you can kind of get a feel for them. But in general, you want to find the fattest pen that's comfortable for your grip. And guys usually have bigger hands than girls. So ladies, I should say. So uh, fellas especially need a fatter pen. Now, do you get the, uh, you demonstrated uh not appliances, but uh, like tools for the side of the bed or mm -hmm. around the toilet, et cetera, to increase safety. Where do you mm -hmm. get these or do you uh, get them through your medical provider? So you definitely can get it through your medical provider. Um, and Contra Costa County, if you live in Contra Costa County, because um, I know this is a Mount Diablo network, um, they, with the home, um, Meals on Wheels, 
they have a home safety evaluation that they can do one time to your home um, as long as you meet the criteria. And if you go into their website, they actually have um, criteria and the application for it, but it's a free service. They will send out an occupational therapist to your home to do the home safety consultation and for them to actually give you your specific recommended um, equipment that you might need. Because everyone's sort of individualized and set up of the spacing and how they get up and the height and everything. So it's good to do the individual assessment from the therapist to know what they would recommend for you. So it's Meals on Wheels, Home Safety Evaluation from Contra Costa County. Okay, great. Yes, Janice. Yeah, I've heard that, that Meals on Wheels Mount Diablo will also install grab bars. Oh, that's great. As well, as well as do the evaluation. Yeah, I'm sure the, um, I know when they come out to the home, they'll give you resources as far as who you can contact depending on your area to get them installed. I know that Lowe's and Home Depot also have a um, some someone who can come out and do it too. And I also have a list of ADA contractors that I tend to work with that know how to do the adaptations. Yes, Janice. Can you say a little more about in the toilet area? Um, uh -huh. For example, I mean, sometimes it's hard to get a walker near the toilet and and even if you have a grab bar by the toilet, uh, there's sort of a space, there's a gap <laughs> between. Um, so what do you recommend? Yeah, that's where I would definitely have the therapist come out to the home is to see the exact measurements and what would be the best uh, technique for him to be able to maneuver in there. Um, there's lots of creative ways there. People have gotten uh, grab railings inside the toilet on the way to the, to into the toilet seat itself, um, if there wasn't enough room. Or could it be just sidestepping instead of going straight in? It might be a technique of how you can maneuver in there so that you're um, able to go in a little safer. Okay. But um, it really does depend on just the, the space, the angle, positioning, and then how he's doing so that they can give you that recommendation. Okay, thank there's, you. There's, there's also poles that people have installed too. So yeah, it just depends on your setup. You said you have a, a list of ADA contractors or others. Is there a comprehensive list that you can share with me that I can put on our YouTube description? Sure, I'll send that to you at the end. How's that? Okay, great. Because, because we don't, recommend one over the other. They're just a general list <laughs> of sure. contractors, yeah. But we know that they've they've worked with people with ALS, so um, they're used to doing a lot of modifications in the home. So any one of those contractors would be good. These are good are, questions. Are there any other questions for now or? Should we just continue with the presentation and it'll generate more questions? That sounds good. Well, and this next part is about hand stretches. So I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna share the visual for a second and then I'm gonna have you come back to me. So the hand stretches, what we're trying to do is open the hands as much as we can because what the small movements tend to do is bend them. And so some of these stretches that I'm gonna be going through, it's all about opening and separating. And then of course the power moves. Okay, so I'm gonna have you come back to me. I'm gonna have you sit back where you're sitting nice and flat. Let me see which ink got to move, I have to move this way. Your feet should be nice and flat on the floor. You should sit away from the back of the chair. So you're not slouched like this, right? You're coming up to the, almost to the edge of the seat so that your feet are nice and flat and planted. If you see my side angle, my back is upright. I'm not slouched down like this. I'm pulling my trunk up as high as I can. That's the starting position. Okay, is everybody there? 
Well, can't hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully. And I should say safety is first. So <laughs> I don't want to hear about people falling <laughs> during this video. Is that <laughs> make sure you're nice and safe. And if for some of you who have really pretty good balance, you can try these standing as well too. Okay. But here's the first stretch. I want you to extend your fingers out and like you're giving someone a big high five. Now, when we talk about intent, we want to not just go like this. You see how it's just small of the, we want to go open and nice and big and wide and spread. Okay. And then we're going to slap it down on our knee, our thighs. Great. So let's try that again. We're going to go open and slap. Ready? Open. Nice and slap. What's, what the slapping does is that it gives you that proprioception of the hand and sending that sensation message up into the brain. So that's what the slapping is good for. Okay, let's do it one more time. You ready? Open and slap. Now, when I say open to in my side angle, I don't want to open to just here. I want to open with the full extension of my elbow as well because that's going to get it lengthened all the way through my my wrist too i don't want to just stop here i want to try and extend that range extend that range as far as i can okay so let's do it one more time you ready open and slap nice okay and the second one i'm going to stand up so you can see me a little bit better we're going to open out to the side. And when we open out to the side, again, straighten out that elbow as much as I can. Turn my palm up as much as I can. Uh-oh. I lost you. Oh, I got you back. Can you see me still? Yes. OK. All right. So. Most of our daily activities is in this downward position. If you use a walker, it's in this downward position. All the writing, all the eating stuff are all in this downward position. So we need to stretch it up and open. So from here, ready? Let's open and come back and open. Straighten that elbow, remember that? Fingers wide and open. And slap. And one more time. Open. And back. Are your fingers feeling like they're opening up yet? Are they waking up a little bit? Yeah, mm -hmm. and these are great stretches to do before you start getting dressed, before you start writing, because it's just kind of opening up your whole system here. And when it's being small and being pulled this way, we're opening it up to wake it up. Okay? Here's another exercise I like. We're gonna do like a scissors. So one arm's gonna go up and the other one's gonna go back. You're gonna go up to your comfort range where it's not hurting, but you can feel the stretch. You see how my hands are open and active all the way through the fingertips. And then we're gonna switch. Very good. And switch. Get that elbow straighter, a little straighter. Yes, that's it. Reach and reach. There you go. And reach. Very good. So that's a nice one for the shoulder, right? For the fingers. Now, if we try to isolate each of the fingers, okay, and it's all about opening and stretching, we can do it a couple of different ways. One of the easier ones is when you do tip to tip, you wanna hold the other fingers up. So they're not down here like this, but the other guys are up and active while I'm pinching at that finger. And then we're gonna to go to the middle finger. Do you feel that stretch? If you hold the other guys up, you should feel that stretch. Okay, and then the fourth finger. And then the pinky. Now, if your fingers don't have that range, then you can definitely help to stretch it nice and easy. Okay, you can do a prayer stretch and just do a gentle stretch to give it that range of motion on each side. 
Okay. You can also do numbers. So let's count. Do one and extend that elbow again so that we have it nice and stretched. Straighten out that elbow. We're going to do two and hold the other guys down and feel the stretch in their fingers. Three. And four. And five. What's even better with Parkinson's if you do this with your voice so that your voice is also being activated and you're saying it out loud, right? Shake your hands a little bit. Shake your shoulders a little bit. So this time when you're counting, let's do it out loud, okay? And let's start with one, one hand at a time. Let's do one. One. Nice and loud. Two. Two. Three. Three. Uh-oh, what happened to three? <laughs> Four. Four. There you go. And five. 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 Good. Hold your five up. Six. 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 Seven. 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 Eight. 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 Nine. Nine. And ten. 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 Good. Shake it out. Did you feel those stretches? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you did them right, you should have definitely felt them. Now yeah, it's also a lot of folks are muted, so you're not going to hear them. Okay, <laughs> hopefully they're <laughs> doing them, huh? <laughs> okay, let's go backwards now. Let's start from ten. So let's start stretch with the ten. Ready? Go ten. ten. Nine. Nine. Eight. Eight. Seven. Seven. Six. Six. Five, four, four, three, three, two, two, one. One. Now, obviously, there's different ways you can do one. You can play around with whichever finger you hold up, but it's about stretching those fingers, individualizing them, so you feel all nice and stretched out. Because I will guarantee they're going to want to tighten up this way. They're not going to tighten up this way because we have mm -hmm. more muscles that bend and straighten. So all the stretching, and especially with the power exercises that we'll be going through is all about opening and stretching and lengthening, okay? All right, so for those who can't stand, you can do it in sitting, but let's go through some, of, some basic power moves, okay? All righty, so from here, we're gonna open and then close. Right, open and close. Feel the difference, open. Can you say that now and close? close. Ready, open, open. and close. close. Okay, great. Now the next one is to go side to side. Now you see, I, I like to have my open hands like jazz hands. Right, they're all nice and active all the way through. Okay, so let's reach. And the other arm, remember those scissors that we talked about? So it's to lengthen and stretch. So right and left. Right and left. Make sure the back hand is nice and straight and active as well, too. You got both active hands going on. There we go, okay, good. And then another, which is also my favorite, is that you start off nice and wide, and then we twist to clap, come back out, and clap, and come back out. Give that good clap to the hand, and open wide, clap, and open wide. All righty, how did that feel? Good. Great. Yeah. Doing any of these exercises, I like to say it's like brushing your teeth. Just do them every single day, like twice a day. It'll be good to help maintain your range of motion, your general strengthening of your trunk and your postural muscles, because everything's going to want to come down and you want to really work on that opening. And this really helps to expand that and to keep that 
as much as possible. All right, any questions on that? No, I just want to remind people that when they when the YouTube video of this presentation is posted, people can constantly come back on a day-to-day -day basis and watch you guide them through the exercises. Safely, right? <laughs> well, obviously safely, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah. And if you remember one thing from today, the biggest takeaway I wanted you to get is to stretch those hands nice and open. That is so very powerful for those small little muscles. Okay, before you do any sort of typing, writing, buttoning, just stretch those hand muscles as wide as you can. Okay, that'll really help. Okay, back to the PowerPoint. Um, we also address cognition and the thinking skills is just as important. Um, looking at different compounding factors of why your thinking may be slowing down a little bit. Um, the reduce in dopamine, the, the vitamin B12 deficiency. Um, some may have experienced some um, depression or anxiety, but sleep is a huge factor. Um, so you want to get as much restful sleep. Um, and then any sort of, if you do experience any sort of medication side effects or infection, please contact your doctor because um, we want you to get all these addressed as soon as you can. So what are our brain skills? These are sort of the main components that we look at. It's your attention, your ability to concentrate, the processing speed. Um, you may find that some of the, you wanna say something, but then you're about a sentence behind everybody, just when you're thinking about saying it, it comes out a little late. Um, the word finding, you, you wanna, you have something that you know you wanna say, but it's not quite there. The best strategy for that is to move on and to try to describe all around it and, and then come back to it. Because sometimes when you get stuck on a certain word, then it has a difficulty coming back to it or just persevering on it. Um, memory, the memory, the um, if you're having trouble with that, I would say write things down as much as you can, more than you typically would, because you won't remember what you don't remember unless someone <laughs> reminds you. <laughs> or you have some feedback of what you need to remember. So just overwrite things down if you're having a little trouble with memory, that will give you the checks and balance. And the visual processing, that can also be slowed down a little bit. And I'll talk a little bit more about that with the driving. So what can we do to help improve and maximize our brain function? Exercise, that is number one key, as we know with Parkinson's, you gotta keep moving keep moving that body that helps with the blood flow and oxygen uh, flowing through your body. So the more you move, the better it is. This has been proven over and over again with Parkinson's. Eat right, drink plenty of water. The recommended guideline is you're half your body weight in ounces. And so what I tend to do is I know that this is 32 ounces. And I need to have so many of these per my day. And that's my goal every single day because that's my half my body weight in ounces. And so you want to think about what your goal is. And thank you for drinking, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> as far as getting enough fluids in you every single day. Now, if you have swallowing precautions, that's another. You definitely have to follow that as far as safety first. But in general, you want to stay well hydrated, especially now as we're getting into the warmer weather. Okay, good night sleep. Um, sleep is very, very important because it gives you the recharge throughout the night. And there's lots of apps and tools that are out there that helps um, with the sleep. They say sleep is a 24 hour activity because what you do during the day also matters and how it influences at night. So if you're having trouble sleeping, you should definitely consult your medical professionals about um, what you can do to help that. But during the day, getting the sunlight, getting some nice natural vitamins and getting into a nice routine and exercising is going to help you sleep better at night. And then reducing some of your um, electronic technology so that you're not getting that over visual stimulus and you're winding down into a good routine is also important to helping you sleep at night. Socialize. Um, we, they say that they've had studies of um, people who age well, 
and age um, long. And one of the key things that they found was that they are a socialized human beings, is that they're in a network of community. So this is great that you're involved in this support group because the more you engage in others and interact with others, that's also important, okay? Multitasking, when we used to do five things at once, we may be able to do that when we're younger, but it's not proven to be that great. To really focus your attention on one thing at a time and doing that well and completing it is more successful and beneficial. And for fun, you can challenge yourself by playing a new game or learning a new skill. Um, I always say do what you'd like to do too, because the more you enjoy doing something, then you're better off doing that and you'll be more interested in doing that. So coming up with a new hobby or interest and doing that for an exploration is actually a great brain skill set. And then practicing the mindfulness um, along with stress reduction techniques. Okay, how much time do we have? Okay, so one of the breathing techniques that tends to help calm both the tremors and your body is the diaphragmatic breathing and uh, purse lip breathing. I think if we have time, we'll come back to this maybe at the end and then review that together. Okay. Okay. All right. So in driving, I don't, for some of you that are driving, one of the precautions that happen with Parkinson's is that your reaction time may start to slow down. And that's natural because the motor, motor connection tends to um, be not as prompt and succinct as we would like them to be. And one of the ways to um, really control that is to keep exercising and keep moving. Even in front of um, the TV, you can practice two targets on your foot and just practice jumping from one to another so that you keep up those skills and the motor coordination. But some of the safety factors you, sh you should consider is that nighttime driving is a higher crash risk than daytime driving. I think you guys all know this, but it's one of the safety things that we like to review. Driving when you're tired slows down your reaction time. The freeway driving, for some of you who are sort of on the border of, of how quick you can respond, is that you have to respond so much quicker at a faster speed that if you can stay within the main roads, that's more ideal. And accidents happen more frequently and more detrimentally at a high speed. And then the high traffic hours and routes, limiting distractions, you, you, you can say to the person next to you and say, hey, I really need to concentrate on my driving and getting there. And then when we get there, I'd love to talk to you. So limiting that, turning off your cell phone, the bad weather conditions, you know how much more accidents go up when there's a drop of rain here in this area, right? So just consider, do I really need to be out there during these times? And then when you're having to go to a new route, someplace you've never been before, it's good to actually plug it in to the computer or to your navigator and say, okay, how am I going to actually get there? So that you already have knowledge of where you're going to be going and how you're going to be getting there before you actually get into the car. And that helps to guide so that when you are following the directions at the time, then it's easier to follow. And I like to remind people that driving is a privilege. It's not a right. And so it's a privilege we want to maintain as long as possible and as safely as possible. So if you take these precautions now, they're going to maximize your safety. And of course, we have some resources. Um, AARP, they, if, you don't have to be a member, but um, if you are, you even get a discount. You can go onto their website and they have a driving safety class that anyone over 55 can take. You can take it, I believe, every three years and they'll give you a discount on your car insurance. So I always say, who doesn't like to save money, right? So you should, you should take this class. They used to have an offer in the community, but um, now they might be online. So you might have to check and see where that's um, being taught. AAA also has great um, resources online for senior driving if you wanna go on there. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the OTs at outpatient clinics tend to do a pre-clinic evaluation to see what kind of a crash risk we are. Um, if you pass with flying colors with no any signs of detriments, because we look at your, your motor, your cognitive, your visual, your coordination, and uh, your reaction time, um, 
when you're in this middle zone of um, medium crash risk, then sometimes we recommend actually hiring a private certified driver specialist. And they're trained professionals who can take you out on the road and give you that insight and recommendation of what kind of a risk you may be. Um, so that's some resource there for you. And we recommend these folks instead of the um, just your average traffic driving, driving instructors because they're more for geared toward teenage driving, whereas these are medical professionals. Okay, and then some of the resources that um, we talked about as far as where to get some of these supplies and um, different adaptive tools available. I've listed them here as along with the Parkinson's Wellness Recovery Program. And they also have different apps that they recommend, which is great. Some are free, some are not, but um, some apps you can download and consider to help you with your movement and your meditation and mindfulness, and even some voice training, because we know the voice tends to get a little quiet, but I'll help you with that. And then medication and system tracking, there's some apps that can help you with that too, as a reminder. So Rick has all these slides that he'll post on the website. Yes. Okay. So question, do we have folks. any questions? Why don't we, um, you know, stop the screen sharing so that people can see you? Okay. All right. And if you want to ask a question, just unmute yourself and ask. I'm wondering where um, we could find that uh, list that you just showed of apps. Um, is there a particular organization that does that? That was provided from that uh, power, the wellness recovery program. Oh, um, from, yeah. And, the, and yeah. The, that was from the uh, Parkinson's Association? It was from the, the Parkinson's Wellness Recovery, the power um, from Parkinson's there. Parkinson's Wellness Recovery, OK. Right. So one of the things we're going to do when we post the video, which will be up within two days, uh, is that our IT person will also post the slides on our website so that you can actually not only see the video, but go through the slides. And if there is information that you need from any of those slides, they'll be right there, including the power moves stuff. Yeah, I would encourage going on to the power um, website if you haven't been to already. They have wealth of knowledge and resources and virtual classes you can take from them as well that you can actually participate with. And also don't forget folks that if you have questions, we're just an email away. Mm -hmm. You so can that email them to rick.stevens at pnmd.net or web at pnmd.net. That's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. We'll get back to you. That power is spelled P-O-W-R. It's actually no. just P-W-R explanation point. Oh, got it. Thank you. Yeah. June, could you demonstrate the diaphragmatic breathing exercise oh, yeah, sure. that you mentioned? Do we have time for that? Yeah. OK. OK. So, oh, maybe I'll just, um, instead of showing the picture, this is what I'm going to be going through. But I want you to have one hand on your belly and one hand on your chest. And um, remember the posture that we oh, talked yeah. about where you, you're not going to be slumping like this. You got to be at the edge of your chair. <laughs> you got to be feet flat and you're sitting as tall as you can, right? As tall as posture. I always, I like to say too, like pretend there's like a string being pulled up from your chest. So from here, you're kind of being pulled up nice and tall. Okay. So you want to be as tall as you can first. And with one hand on your chest, one hand on your belly, what you're gonna do is take a deep breath through your nose. And then you, you should feel your stomach go away from your bottom hand. And then when you exhale, you should feel it deepen here and expand here in your tummy. Okay, the goal is to see if you can make your exhale twice as long as your inhale. So let's try again. So breathe in through your nose. And 
and exhale. Now, do not worry if you did not get this this first round. This actually takes quite a bit of practice to get because if you're not used to breathing in this manner, it's, it's, it takes a little bit of time to practice. But I encourage you to practice because this really does help with relaxation. It helps with some of that tone and rigidity and some of that spasticity and the tremors and just that reduction of stress. So if you, again, pull in and breathe in through your nose and have your hand, um, your stomach muscles pull away from your stomach and then exhale. You should feel it press into your hand. Which one was twice as long as the other? Exhale. Breathe in. So you want to breathe in with the nose for like one, two, and then it would be one, two, three, four, and the exhale. Think of it that way. Breathe out. out breathe in. Yeah. When you exhale, does your chest sort of go down a bit? Yes. Your yes. stomach goes out? Yeah. It should go the opposite, right? It should yeah. go the opposite. So when you breathe in, yeah, it's going to go up and then down. Yeah. Okay. So you Thank should you. feel the opposite effect of your chest and your stomach, right? That's why you have that. If they're, if, if they're not moving at all, we got to keep practicing. <laughs> mm -hmm. we all have those core muscles in there somewhere we got to find them right yeah. but um sometimes when you do those big chest expansion type of stretches first it's just going to get those ex muscles expanded and more ready to be able to breathe better because when you kind of start off down here it's a little more difficult so yeah the getting your trunk upright and stretching before you start that diaphragmatic breathing it tends to help Thank you. Sure. Uh, June, this has been a fabulous presentation. And okay. I think it's probably one that people will watch again and again and use, you know, for guidance on how to do exercises. I know that I will. Oh, good. Thank you for inviting me. And you can forward any questions up my way too, since you know my email. So I'll be happy to address them. Okay. <laughs> since okay. You since you're at, before we leave, since you're a Kaiser person, can I ask you a Kaiser question? As long as you know it's not being sanctioned by the Kaiser. Group. <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, uh, our neurologist uh, put in a request for um, a Parkinson-specific walker, but the um, uh, the, uh, the part that that has um, machinery, you know, and sends that out with so the light. Uh huh. Yeah, says that they needed a, a, a occupational therapy recommendation, although we did have a physical therapy recommendation. Do you know anything about that? Uh, that's interesting. Usually you have to go through the uh, durable medical equipment. Yeah, that's that's the words I was trying to think of. Yeah. So when, when I called them, they said we needed an OT uh, recommendation, but we already had a physical therapist and the neurologist. They actually recommend the, there's a therapist that works specifically for durable medical equipment. And they're the oh, only ones who, yeah, they're the only ones who actually do the write-up of justification for the um, equipment. Okay. And so that's what they meant. All right. So we need to, do we make that uh, appointment through uh, durable medical equipment? Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Many people find that confusing, but um, in Kaiser, yeah. we have just, yeah, one department that just handles all the equipment processing and ordering. Got it. Thanks. So we can make the recommendations, but they end up doing all the paperwork. Mm -hmm. That's what they meant. Mm -hmm. Good. I wish they had told us that at first. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> they just, somebody said, well, we're referring it, you know, and the neurologist will okay it and, you know, then yeah. they'll send it. No, it would never come. <laughs> well, yeah, I, you glad know, you attended this lunch and learn. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, if you're if ordered something and you know you should be in contact with somebody and no one's contacting you, con yeah. bug, bug your neurologist again because something's not right. Okay. Um, yeah, or your therapist if you're if you have a therapist that you're following because mm -hmm. we'll help you navigate you to the right person. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Are there any last questions or comments? Very helpful, thank you. Very, very helpful. Yeah, excellent presentation. Very, very, very helpful. <laughs> great, great presentation, June. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Happy exercising and stretching, everybody. Okay, well, thank you too, June. <laughs> and you too. Okay. <laughs> With the white bye. <laughs> okay, bye. Wide open. Bye. Okay, bye bye. Yeah. Take care, folks. And again, if you have any questions, email us at info at pnmd.net.